I know. I I I I I didn't come up with the list. Same fandom. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to another of our 60th anniversary Doctor Who special videos. Uh, myself, uh, Michael S. Collins, and uh, Mr. John Arnold. Hello. Um. Today we have asked our friends and fans, fellow fans of Doctor Who, uh, to compile. Ratings on their favourite Doctor Who companions. And we have a top 25 of them for you. So, number 25, starting us off, Clara. So, like, she falls into that Moffat uh, kind of stereoty almost stereotype companion of the, of the female companion who doesn't take any of the Doctor's shit, basically. Well, yeah. companions are super accurate. Absolutely. She is a co-pilot almost. She, she, she wants to be the Doctor and she, she can't end up being Doctor. Th there's a criticism with Steve Moss companions in particular that, that they, you know, they're co-leads, you know, that we it's Doctor Who. The companion's been a joint lead since Russell T. Davis brought the show back. You haven't been paying attention if, if you think it's any different. I think her finales are some of the best that Doctor Who's ever been. For all, yeah, I'm pro Clara. I think she works much better with Peter Capaldi's Doctor. Um, I don't think, I, you know, I think she works much better when she's like be a character rather than just the impossible girl plot point. My biggest issue with her, apart from the fact that after a while you can have too many of the most important companions of all time, you'd rather have someone nice and down to normal like Bill Potts. Um, yeah. Uh, is the that like I said, another companion we will reach much higher on the list. It felt like her story came to her natural end, and then they kept it going. So, um, I know she was originally meant to be, uh, she's meant to exit the show in last Christmas, the Christmas special. Yes, yeah. you got all the false endings there, which can't be. Yeah, and even if that produces one of your favourite stories that you wrote the show. <laughs> um, I feel like it, it extends her narrative more than it was needed. I point out, despite that, she, she, Jenna Coleman herself is very good in the, the role, especially in her dual role in the Zygon invasion. Is oh, she, Bonnie, yes. Yes, she's, she's having a ball on that one. She, she does differentiate the performances well enough that you can that you never in doubt who you're looking at. Number 24, Nardole, uh, Matt Lucas's uh, comic relief uh, help from Peter Capaldi's last season. Although he was introduced in a Christmas special, uh, the Husbands in of the River song. I, I, I love that. And the idea of Matt Lucas, who is, you know, wh whether you like what he did with Little Britain or not, I don't think even he, I think even he's repented of that these days. Um, I I was never a fan on that. I, I loved him in Shooting Stars when he came into that. But Matt Lucas, a big comedy star, you know, he, he'd had his own shows, um, you know, oh God, I, I'm going to get the title, it's not Pompidou, but it's something, is it Pompidou? It might be Pompidou, actually. He's got, you know, he can do his own series. The idea of him coming into Doctor Who for a year and he's not only just the comic relief, he's got this nice little steel at heart of the performance as well. The exit where he's left to care for these guys on the uh, Mondasian ship to save them. And, you know, uh, that scene he has with Capaldi, where he holds his own against Capaldi. Mm -hmm. Ooh. And I was like, he, he was ple pleasantly surprisingly good, didn't it? I thought. Yeah. Number 23, I think we've noticed by now that the Jodie Whittaker era of Doctor Who has been um, badly underrepresented in these polls, I'm afraid. So imagine how good you had to be in the role to even get here. Uh, and it's Graham as played by Bradley Walsh. I, I think that is it's entirely justified. Bradley Walsh has that kind of that charm that the the, the old guy with a bit of charm. 
down pat over the years. With the, I, think, I think it's been Coronation Street in a, you know in another other series. I think to the point where because Jodie Whittaker's Doctor doesn't necessarily get the best material for the Doctor, that he gets that he gets the lines and he gets the charm. And he's brilliant. And there's always this wonderful game you can play with Graham's episode, which is when is Bradley Walsh filming the chase? <laughs> we, we know he he almost sells Rats, the Ratskarav Kolos non moral dilemma. <laughs> yes. If, if, if you wish ill upon the, the man who killed your wife, you are worse than the Daleks. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, number 22, Dan Lewis. The character in Flux, Beyond, played by John Bishop. I can't I quite know that because he is an an everyman character, and he, he's looking for the for the comedy in every line on that. But there's a really nice rapport that brings out the best of Mandip Gill. I think there, just that it's a it's kind of a believable relationship between colleagues. That's he hits a bunch of St. Adams for a walk. That's not the like. <laughs> and he, he surprisingly well he surprisingly adjusts well to him to cope with weeping angels. Absolutely. And it should be said, he's a Liverpool fan, so he's far <laughs> too low on the list. Number 21 shocks me, not because they're on the list, but because they're so low on the list. It's Joe Grant. Wow. Yes. I, well, I, I mean, Katie Manning is absolutely perfect. She's you can say she's putting a performance for a almost a, you know a, a family TV show, a children's TV show, but it's absolutely perfect for what she does. And if you want to know how good she is, how she turns it round in that in the Green Death, mm -hmm. where she breaks your heart. You can't think of the Pertwee era for well generation without thinking of the Third Doctor and Joe. They are they are the Tardis team. Absolutely, it's kind of pertinent. You is is the kind. It's got last the first and last season. The kind of brackets around the yes. kind of what. There are stories which I don't like as many others, but it's like that see that series nine uh, season nine box set came out, and you can watch that straight through from first last. I know the mutants gets bad press. I I love the mutants because it, it, it's just they're all so well produced. There's sort of something to love in every story, even the time monster. I think works. Oh, I mean, it is my favourite error of the show. Um, but I also like, there's growth in the character, because like, you start where she's easily hypnotised by the Master in her first episode to the last Master appearance that she's in, where she can, like, she can uh, be immune to being hypnotised and possessed. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, um, what's it? yeah uh, you've got, I've got O-levels in science. I didn't say I passed. Yes. Or uh, we start with the first season, the doctor's more snappy at her, and it ends with him so friendly that he has to leave when she gets married because he's going to start crying. His, yeah. the, the, their relationship is... It's almost you who. Yeah, it, it's... I, I, I know there's a difference in class being carried, but it's like Rose years later. She's not necessarily academically smart as Liz was. She's She's just in, instinctively, instinctively smart. She's, you know, she's human. She's got that that thing that the doctor maybe sometimes lacks, and she and she just will keep going. She'll be persistent, and she will find a way to win. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Underrated here, I would say. Yes, yeah. and Katie, of course, <laughs> bonkers, but absolutely the loveliest person on the planet. Yes, so I hear. Yeah. Before I continue, John, by the way, uh, your cam is flickering madly. Is that your end or mine? Uh, mine looks okay, looking at the top of it. It might, it might be the light situation, Kim, but I'm, I'm okay on mine. My end, okay. I don't know. Uh, is mine flickering or is it fine? Yours is, yours is okay. Yours kind of freezes for about half a tenth of a second or so occasionally, but that's it. I think yeah. that's the uh, general computer grumpiness, I'm afraid. Oh, God. I'm drowned because my wife's going to sleep. Some old having, like, something or other. 
Ooh. Ah, the books are back. Yes. And, the, oh, and, and uh, the, the, that's actual me, oh, by the way, since she said you'd never be introduced. Uh, <laughs> uh, one, day, one day they may be an actual uh, book, uh, kids book based on um, Sarah, Sarah once one. But yes, um, and now through the process of editing, people will be like, wow, it's changed. Yes. He's teleported. Teleported. With the benefit of editing your computer gremlins. Twentieth. <laughs> oh, here's an interesting one. Patrick. I'm I'm mildly surprised to see him quite high, but I, I like that he's on the list. I do like to see he is really interesting with Tom Baker's Doctor because again, there's that relationship of the the master and the pupil there. It, it's, he works really well with an older Doctor and I think he just gets a little lost with Peter Davison's Doctor in that kind of that four people TARDIS crew. I think he struggles in Logopolis because anyone would struggle with the dialogue he gets, which is basically... Ikea questions the Doctor can uh, explain a lot to the audience. Yes, well, you you, you know, it's it's Tom Baker's last story you're there to watch Tom Baker. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think his best, apart from the one he dies in, he's, where he's reasonably good, his best story might be Black Orchid, where he's just himself. I I love Black Orchid for the fact that you know, it, you see the TARDIS crew chill, just yes. relax, and you so rarely see that in any story. It's just gorgeous. You know, he, and what does he do? He goes away and scoffs as much food as he can. Yes. I can relate to him there. <laughs> it, it's full table. <laughs> what do you have? I'll have a buffet, thank you. <laughs> the whole of it. Yes. All of it. Okay. <laughs> uh, number 19... Oh, maybe a bit emotional because we sadly lost him last summer. It's TV legend and uh, part of all of our childhoods, the great Bernard Cribbins as Wolf. Oh, uh, um, you know, I don't know how much you can say about Bernard Cribbins because he is magnificent. Wolf was. A one-off role, and then he was a late substitution. Obviously, when, when Howard Atfield um, unfortunately became mm -hmm. one, he was magnificent. I, I when he died, I I went to rewatch a story. I picked the end of Time Parts One and Two, and if you watch it as his story, it is magnificent. He holds that together beautifully. You know, he, he gives David Tennant something. Up. You got David Tennant as this young guy. And then you're looking at the older guy who's been there, done that, who's kind of got the perspective that, from a physical point of view, if not you know, the time point of view, that, that that doctor doesn't have. Yes. And yeah, the, the moments where Russell T. Davis needs to break your hand, that hero, you know, where, where Donna's mind gets wiped, where the doctor's going to die, and... Yeah, in, in the end of time, he, he, he kills the 10th Doctor, basically, <laughs> by being a nice yes. guy. And and then at the end, where he does the salute, it's like, oh, I, I cannot say enough good things about Bernard Cribbins, about Wilf, and about the way he can make Russell T. Davis's dialogue, which is good at the best of times, absolutely sing. He was a TV legend, and he made any show he was on better by being on it yep. and I think if people want to see Wilf at his best they go. They should go to turn left and see him in the parallel earth because Wilf has some of the best and difficult scenes in it and Bernard Pippins just knocks him straight Oh the scenes where they're up in Leeds with the Italian family of Beautifully done. Two to the fourth. I mean, a TV legend. What, what can we say? Yeah. 
Number 18, uh, Mel. Wow. Yeah. I, I love that, again, I love that Mel's coming. Bonnie Langford has a lot of trouble with this one because Mel is almost a blank slate. She's, she's that John Nathan Turner thing where this is where she's from. This is her job. She's got a good memory. There you go. Mm -hmm. there's, there's almost nothing for an actor to work from. Whatever you know, the flaws of Mel at the time, it wasn't Bonnie Langford's fault. And Bonnie Langford, I think, again, big finish, and obviously the subsequent long career in EastEnders has <laughs> proved a dramatic chop since. And she's great. And it, it's when you get to stuff like Delta and the Bannermen or the human, the kind of scenes which need a more human touch, the warmer touch with Pex in Paradise House, for instance, or when she's leaving the Doctor in Dragonfire. She's brilliant in those scenes. It's just that there, there's a natural charm of warmth to her. And you can see why you can see why she was cast. And like, you know, fans of the time who were going, well, she's on the hot shoe show. Or she's got these workout tapes and all that. Yes. People can do more than one thing, guys. And she, I, I, I think she would, I didn't think it at the time, but I didn't think that was entirely her fault. Again, I think you put her, particularly with Silver's Doctor, is a ton of energy to that season 24. She shines, she makes it work. Yeah. I should point out that Bonnie Langford was terrifyingly good as a big and there's like scarily good in the role uh, as a monster. Um, I've, I feel like she's a breath of fresh air in the show though, because You've got, in the 80s, you've had the the Romana, you know, you've had the Romana Doctor, various stuff behind the scenes that based it into, oh, you've got the Doctor and Adric, it's always kind of a bit, you've got the Doctor and Tegan, Tegan never wants to be there, she's always grumpy, you've got the Doctor and Perry, which, uh, Possibly the most problematic of the, <laughs> the, the yes, the, yeah, yes. Why you you question why they're traveling together? Yes, very good jump off what, and attack of the side men. I'm just saying, the first time someone tries to strangle me, I'm leaving at the first stop, even if it's Scarrow. <laughs> Rather risk it with the Daleks and the the the, the gas light and the TARDIS. But um, so when you get to Mel. There's been at least half a decade of companions and doctors who don't get on. So just having someone who gets on with the doctor and they enjoy each other's company is just such a breath of fresh air. Absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll come to the companion after at some point. But yes, it's just, it's someone you would, it's someone you'd, you'd be fine travelling with. Mm -hmm. Because they have they're not an absolute pain in the ass half the time. <laughs> and she more than holds her own in paradise to hers. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Number 17. Oh, we're back in the 80s again. It's Nyssa. Okay. Yeah, I, I've never particularly been a huge fan. I, I like the way it's I like the way she's set up, you know, interesting character. She's a competent scientist at a young age. She's well trained, mm -hmm. and she's got the interesting of the master, you know, killing her her home planet off. But she kind of falls into the doesn't get much to do in her stories. I mean, I'm aware. I, I just want to say for the record, Peter Davison did not vote in this poll. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How do you uh, know? <laughs> oh. Um, but uh, when she's given something to do, so like the Arkham Infinity, where she's the sole companion on Gallifrey, or uh, the the visitation where she basically saves the day by creating an anti dandroid, an anti dandroid. No. Yeah. Or the vis the visitation where she creates an anti-android weapon that saves the day. You know, she shines in that role, but 
she uh, really suffers from the overcrowded TARDIS syndrome. Because whenever the the the, the, the three of them there, uh, the first thing they do is have Nissa have a migraine and have to sleep throughout Kinder. Yeah, <laughs> and you uh, don't the character. So you know, what's the their dynamic snake dance as well? I think she's great in as well. Yes. Again. Also, another another one another one who uh, put her effort into Black Orchid. Took the yes double role. Yes. Uh, and it's annoying because Sarah Sutton was such a well regarded child actress, but we've lost almost all of her stuff. Oh, Alice in Wonderland, yes. Uh, including boys and girls go out to play where she is a, a 10-year-old murderer who's blackmailing her father, Peter Jeffrey, who has a drug uh, addiction into keeping quiet about her being the killer, which sounds amazing. Everyone who saw it says it was amazing. It was an episode of Menace, which the episodes we have are amazing, but it's lost. Damn you, BBC. <laughs> I want that as I want that as much as Fury from the Deep and the Moon Landings, to be honest. I want it as much as the Space Pirates Part Five. Bring it all back. Yes. <laughs> oh. Uh, number sixteen is one that definitely should be here because kids loved it, and I loved it, and my sister loved it when we were kids, and. It is of course K9. K9 again, it it's K9 suffered in the 80s from people wanting Doctor Who to be grown up and serious when Doctor Who should never be yes. grown up and serious. He is, yeah, you know, you've got it was perfectly time to cash in, as it, people know, on Star Wars. Because it's the cute robot, it's something they can do on a BBC budget. Why not? And it's, again, I'm sure the canine prop must have been hell to act with, but it's worth being here just for John Lee, the notion of John Leeson crawling around on his hands and knees delivering that canine dialogue. I love the imagery of that. It's, as a companion, canine is also very underrated for be, for, for the sarcasm. Like there's the one where the, the guest character is going, it's a robot dog, who's a little doggy? And K9 just goes, your silliness is noted. Yeah, and the, the way he always beats the Doctor at chess, obviously. Yes. <laughs> so the Doctor cheats. <laughs> love that. And I, I, I love the gag in <laughs> in City of Death. Oh, hello, K9. Yes. <laughs> you can go across the Perizian streets. <laughs> there you go. One line to explain where K9 is. <laughs> yeah. He gets laryngitis and Destiny of the Daleks too. Space laryngitis, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, I'll be honest, it's always been a bit of a blank mark against uh, Bidmies and JNT that they were so recently joyfully cruel about them getting, uh, destroying K9 slowly each episode of season 18. Because, yes, it was a cumbersome prop and it annoyed older fans. But K9 has always been a child favourite. And it gets and it gets against the ethos of what they should be going for in my view. And Bill, Bill Fraser only took that role in Megloss so he could hit K9 by repute, I believe. Which but again, that departure, it'll break your heart. The way the way he's a crumbling and falling in Warrior's Gate. Oh, oh poor K9. And then he came back in the the, the the modern series, uh, and destroyed Anthony Head. Yep, just down the road from where I was living at the time in this in Deathry Vale School. And then he was and a, he, a recurrent. And then he returned at the end. So it's just again, Russell T Davies knows to play those big emotional beats, and there it is. Yes, but then he, Russell pointed out there wasn't there was multiple. The canine gets to regenerate. Yes, <laughs> he's he's picked up something from the doctor. Yes, and he doesn't he show up in the stolen earth as one of the the, the, yes. the 
the the the, the late come the, the late returns to save the day against the Daleks because um I may have been an adult at that point but I cheered a lot. Well, of course it it's the inner seven year old isn't it? Yes. So, yeah. Oh I think we can manage one more and then I'm actually gonna have to restart again because um it's one, it, the companions one's apparently a lot longer than I thought it would be. Uh, number 15 is Stephen. Uh, I love Stephen Taylor. He's yes. uh, the only companion, I think, in the original series who essentially gets his own story, to carry his own story. Yes. Of the massacre, which I saw suggested. Um, as far as I'm concerned, nobody has the worst hand given to them in Doctor Who. Uh, Peter Purvis has to, he has to replace William Russell and Jackie Hill. Uh, he has to be there as the original production team are falling apart and get replaced by someone who's gets a complete breakdown over the show. Uh, he has to cope with the fact that the leading actor starts to become quite obviously ill. And not yes. as reliable as he was previously. Uh, and he has to deal with the fact that they're not giving stronger roles out through the cast uh, to like fem uh, to the female assistants. So he has to be, be he essentially has to be the pseudo doctor and main character and cement and everything around the show while everything else is Tilting, and despite that, he completely knocks out of the park. He's amazing in the role. Uh, he does horror and drama and farce. Uh, the gun fighters there for you. Uh, equal a poem. Um, and the wit, the witty comedy again in the Myth Makers as well. He mm -hmm. did everything. I think it's helped as well that I I know he's in that you know the last episodes of the chase. But his proper introductory story is the time meddler, and he gets a really great meaty yes. chunk of that. It's it's brilliant, you know. He comes in, he's he's absolutely sarcastic about it all. It's like, yeah, right, for an entire series. And it's so beautifully that you know it, it it's it's one of the key roles. I think he is a deeply underrated companion. Because I I would have loved to have seen him stay a little bit longer. I you know yes. he is he is one of the best things about the black and white era, and there are a lot of good things about that era. And there's a there's a story I don't know how true or apocryphal it is that uh, what spurred him to leave the show and acting basically is that he was in the loo and he overheard one of the BBC executives bemoaning how terrible a terrible actor of the boy in Doctor Who was and that just destroyed his confidence I as think, an actor yeah, think, and yeah. if that's true that's just I think what the, what kind of does suffer is that we are missing so much of his era mm -hmm. just a chunk of it he'd be a lot more highly rated if we could see that performance that he's giving as well yes judge it for a lot of it because because a lot of it was missing for so long people were able to base it on older fans and peter burris himself who very rarely said it's his own acting with anything is being good yes. um as I, I learned my, as I, I learned myself when i was praising him on twitter and he was like he 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 he, 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 he assumed i was uh, insulting him not at all um and as he's, as I say, he now likes the gunfighters because people have been able to experience people saying how much they actually enjoy watching it. And I just hope that after so long of these, I mean, hearing people say, oh, he wasn't that good or he was middle of the road, that people actually tell him at these conferences that Peter mm -hmm. Purvis was a good, great Doctor Who companion because he was and deserves the accolades. Right, I need to say end and restart. Let's do it. Number 14 is Bill Potts.
Hey! Hey! You, are, you cannot help but love Bill Potts. Pearl Mackie is such fantastic casting on that. Yes. Um, I said, I like Clara, but Pearl Mackie just brings the energy to the rock. She, and, you know, she nails her all. Um, again, all, all Steve Moffat's companions, they question the Doctor, but she's kind of the one who does, is, who's, most, who's lightest about it almost. It's, you know, it, it's the not not in any way antagonistic or self-serving mm-hmm. it's it's curiosity almost and yes. her own you know in post, helping you know the doctor with the morality of it you you cannot help but love a companion who ends up as an immortal space lesbian yes brilliant yeah she has the tragic end of being converted into cyberman but then she's saved by her immortal uh, lesbian puddle girlfriend Yes, I, I I think that if if I was going to change anything about a season, I would have maybe snuck a little reminder about you know yeah. of, of the of Heather in somewhere in the middle of the season just to keep things ticking. Yeah. But no, I I, I do like uh, Bill Potts' character. Uh, she works well with the Doctor, uh, in both in sci-fi and historical. Uh, and they managed to so successfully quickly build trust between Doctor and Companion uh, so that, for example, oxygen wouldn't work unless you knew the Doctor and Bill trusted each other. Yes. There, there's no jeopardy in the pyramid at the end of the, the world unless you believe that Bill has 100% faith that the Doctor will get them out of whatever she has to do to save them. Uh, you're never in doubt the Doctor is going to save her on the the Mondas black hole spaceship, and he doesn't. Yeah, and and I know, um, I know that that plays very very differently in America to how it does over here as well. Um, mm-hmm. With with the shooting, but, okay. She breaks your heart as a Cyberman. Yes. That, that's no mean feat. But on the flip side, she can really do the comedy as well. Yes. You know, chips in the first episode. The Pope, for instance. The Pope <laughs> interrupting a date. It's beautiful. And uh, she's very good and thin ice. There's quite a, quite a good dynamic between her and the, the Dickensian orphans. Oh yeah, and and the way she sells, it's like she's seeing the past and she's happy and delighted. To- yeah, a drill punchline where uh, the doctor reminds her they're in history and she can't react to everyday racism. And she's got to think, and she nods and accepts it. And then the the, the, chap, the chap from uh, Manchester Woman walks in and. Uh, utters his uh, racism and what happens with the doctor turns around and immediately belts the guy <laughs> blows the yeah. cover brilliant you, you can't not you can't yes. not look for where the doctor punches a racist act oh. number 13 she's going to be back soon it's Donna Noble hey I, okay I, I have a much higher I can understand why people did like her in, in The Runaway Bride, maybe, because it is, to a large extent, it's Catherine Tate's persona as we knew it, that big, bold persona. Mm-hmm. But you get her back in Partners in Crime, and you get that rapport with David Tennant. It, it's, you know, and that series, that series is, as I've said to Eddie, as Eddie said back to me, it's a gold era because... No matter how I might not particularly think, you know, the story's great or maybe I'm pulled out by some, maybe a moment of direction or a take I don't like. Those two will keep you watching right through. A lot of people didn't like her in, you know, turn in uh, The Rami Bride, but absolutely turned around. Because you want to travel with these people. It's fun. They want to see the universe. There's a, a moral conflict between them, a clear moral thing. I, I am quite happy to revisit them this year as well. Yes. Um, I 
I can pinpoint the exact moment that I changed my entire view of Donna Noble's running the show. It's one of the best things RTD ever wrote for the show, even though there isn't a line of dialogue in it. I where the, the Doctor and Donna both realise the other is watching the villain from the other ones on the... And, and then eventually they both realise that the villain's just watching the both of them. <laughs> she can, yeah, she can do the comedy, she can do the drama. You know, it's a t- turn left is the showcase of her, uh, yes. obviously. It's Catherine Tate being pushed out to that zone where you you don't know necessarily know she can do that. And she absolutely sells that horror of that Doctorless yeah. parallel universe. Yeah. Uh, and it's the journey she takes on her on from where she was to what she be, how she grows as a person. And I think that's why people had such a trouble with Journey's End because it basically yeah. retcons all of this growth. Totally. The it, the tragedy is she she is what she was beforehand. Yes. And, and I, I think much as it's people got a problem with it, it is a compliment to Russell T. Davis as a writer for making the, that choice. He knows what's going to break an audience's heart. And interestingly, I am wondering if that is one of the reasons why it's Donna who's coming back this year. Because there's unfinished dramatic... Oh. Number 12, that is Marfa. I'm surprised she, she's ahead of Donna, but uh, because I think Donna is, is always is kind of the archetypal. Yes. I think certainly at the time she was in the role, Freeman argument, maybe she wasn't the strongest actress that we've seen, mm-hmm. but she has a lot of charm in there. And I'm not overly, yeah, I, I, I think the writing of Martha was a little bit of a misstep because it was, she was always the rebound girl. Yeah. Uh, she suffers from uh, being given too much of the companion of all the love of the doctor stuff to deal with. Yes. When she's not overly focused on that, a, like uh, Gridlock, for example, or Utopia, she works quite well as a sort of uh, your main counterpoint between the Doctor and whoever he's dealing with. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite pleasantly surprised by that. But 11, just missing the top 10. Zoe. Oh. Zoe, I, yeah, I, I think she is the best of the Trek and female companions. Really competent, and you can see it. She, She's, she's got an absolute spark there. She she raises those stories. I, I don't necessarily think that that sixth season are a hugely strong set of stories overall. But Wendy Pabry is always on. She's always working on so working it. There's always an energy to the scene she's in. I like her joining the stream though. The computer and the invasion. Oh, when she takes the computer down. Oh yeah, and the in the crotons which she uh, where she takes the machine down as well, and the doctor doesn't do as well as she did. Yes, chemistry with Trio Hines and Trouton. Yes, it, it's a trio there, and a proper yes. trio, three-way trio enjoying yeah. each other's company. Yeah, and it's very it's funny how they feel like the archetypal Trouton Tardis team, and they're only in. Trouton's last six stories. Number 10 is Vicky from <sighs> the Hartnell era. Loved, I love that she's up here. Yeah, um, Vicky again. It's a t- again, one of the toughest jobs. She's the first new regular to come in after, obviously, after the show started. Mm-hmm. And it, she gets that in the, in the rescue. You're, you're replacing Carolyn Ford, who didn't get much material. And Morn O'Brien, I think. She was very down on her performance for a long, long time. It's there on the um, interview on that series, the uh, season two box set. She's, she's got more, nothing, nothing to Dan Carroll for. She's got so, so much spark to it. It's, it's I don't know, maybe it's a Liverpool thing. <laughs> but 
yeah, she, she, you know, she gets the Romans, for instance, where she gets the comic material and she nails it. She she finds a way to play those where it's not. Oh my god, this again! I genuinely feel that Maureen O'Brien has better chemistry with William Hartnell than any of his other female companions. Maybe Jackie Hill, but yes. Um, but that's a different thing altogether. So the precursor on that, the, 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 the Third Doctor and Joe thing, that's mm -hmm. entirely on that. So yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm happy that she's top 10. In ways like, you know, for example, how will they get out of the Romans? Oh, they'll just poison Nero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> number nine is evidence that I didn't rig this thing because number nine is Tegan. I like that it's strong that Tegan's a strong female character, and my dad certainly would be happy that Tegan is in the top ten companions. I like Tegan again, but it's it's again what we had with Mel. It's here's a you've got your job description, your nationality, go and make a character out of it. Possibly this th start that thing in the eighties. She's brought down a little bit by the fact that Eric Saywood could not write people who liked each other. Mm. Dressing the character comes almost entirely from Janet Fielding's own personality. It sums up the Saver era when she leaves because she says it's no longer been fun. And I sit there thinking, when was it fun? When your <laughs> aunt got murdered, when you got kidnapped by a homicidal time traveller, when you got kidnapped by the other homicidal time traveller, when you got possessed by a giant snake twice, when your uh, grandfather got kidnapped and nearly murdered. There's not been much fun for it to oh, have started. Have <laughs> <laughs> we ha we'd have to mention the Mara stories because I think that's where Janet's fielding really does shine. Yes. It's, you know... A She's very, very sultry in Kinder for a kid. Oh, she's wonderful in Kinder. Kinder. Uh, and she plays the whole gambit from bullshit, terrified to villainess so yeah. well. Almost tragic, though, because you can see she's in, she's enjoying showing that she's such a, she's actually a good actress. And then once you get through the Mara cycle there, in part four, she has to exchange dialogue with Matthew Waterhouse for a two-minute scene, and you can just visibly see the joy dying from her eyes. <laughs> like, oh, I've, I've had that my ever. moment. <laughs> yes. And again, let, let's let say it, Black Orchid, where, where she's just having fun, dancing, enjoying it. That, that you know, to me, that's the high point of Companions in, yes. in the Hollywood era. They're having that. That's when it was fun. <laughs> it, it, it was fun two years ago, Doc. Number eight, my favorite companion, who should be number one, but it is Leela Louise Jameson. I, I will, I've gone on record saying this. I think that the finest actor of any of any gender to play a companion is Louise Jameson. She. It, you know, she gets this role as a far pitch raging savage, and you can see that you know, without ever looking like she's acting, she's absolutely thought the choices through in every single scene. This is an actress so good, she almost rescues Underworld. <laughs> almost. <laughs> yeah, is it, is it, there's a bit on the horror fang rock commentary, I think, where Tom Baker looks at where I think where she gets the shovel for the coal, and he says, a lesser actress. Would wouldn't have yeah wouldn't have thought to use the shovel, like, like almost like she didn't know how to use it. Beautiful, and you know the questions of it. She can you know that far. It, it's she's not. It's a, it's again a tough role because Leela's naive. She's smart but naive, and she always says that you know in that scene in the roads of death with the with you know which father Ted nicked. 20 yes. years later. This, that's small, that's very far away. That's stupid. Yes. <laughs> it's time for science. They specifically point out, like another companion we're yet to get to, that while well, she is inexperienced with all the top sci-fi in science, she's not thick and she picks up on the stuff very quickly. Uh, yes. Fang Rock, she's debunking uh, pseudoscience because she's already picking it up from her travels with the Doctor. Yeah, the superstition is exit door. 
And I mean, the only down thing I've got with her is obviously she she just booted out the door almost randomly, which is one of the great injustices of Doctor Who. Yes. And the other thing is that she's on Gallifrey and yet they've not brought her back. Only in Big Fish. Absolutely. Yes. Well, she's still acting. There's still time to bring her back. For what, a... If you want an acting masterclass, I, I, I know obviously acting has changed for TV in the way it's done. You know, it's no longer rehearse and record. It's you always pick the best on takes. It's an absolute masterclass of performance. And I would just say to anyone, just watch that. That is. I mean, my, it, that is my favourite performance as a companion of any companion in Doctor Who. And go on so well because I feel like they have so many great moments as a team on screen with their chemistry. Uh, the bit I was thinking about in Fang Rock is at the end when uh, Skin Seal has just been killed. Uh, he's he's one of the great tragic characters because he's essentially just like the lords of the manor, but he acknowledges that he's a flawed human being and he wants to be better, but he can't in all of the times he can't doom's everyone else. And then he dies because he's trying to get these diamonds that he doesn't yeah, he's grabbing on the floor for them. Yeah. And the doctor sees this. And then when the doctor goes up to the to the, to the top of the ice the lighthouse and uh, sets up the weapon. Leela goes to um, wear skin seal, and the doctor turns to her and he says, "He's dead with honor." And it's just it's it just reminds me of uh, Trenchard from the Sea Devils. Yeah. It's yes. the doctor giving dignity to someone who maybe didn't quite earn it, just because it's what it helps the people that are not dead around them cope with it. It's one person who'll think better of him. Yes, yes, absolutely. Number seven, a companion you wrote a book about, technically, or was it an episode you wrote a book about? Rose. I did. Well, I wrote a whole chapter about Rose on this. Uh, Stephen Moffat will say that the reason Doctor Who did so well at that start is Billy Piper. And absolutely, because that whole first season, it, it's essentially it's one big, that one big... It, it is almost a love story. In fact, yes, sorry, it is a love story. Told across 10 different adventures, 13 episodes, which I, I think Christopher Eccleston's exit does benefit because it gives it that perfect end, almost perfect tragic ending. You know, I, being there at the time, Billy Piper was, no, you know, again, in fandom, She's a pop star. She's d she's done basically no acting. Okay, I you know I, I watched her in the Canterbury Tales. I'm like, no, this this she can act. So I, I was really happy. And then you sit down and watch Rose, and you look at that that charm, at that charisma, that star energy there. Oh, it it's yeah. I I don't think in the modern series. They've managed to better the on screen chemistry between Doctor and Companion as they had with Rose and Christopher Eccleston in that first series. Absolutely. I, I think um, Tennant and Tate come close. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the only issue I've got with, with Rose, I think, because I think there's there's an issue with when Billy Piper wants to leave during season two, so that it kind of falls apart with that. Yeah, it, it, you can set the structure is quite shaky across that season. Plus, I feel in season two they kind of lean on her cruelness a bit more than I'd like it to, or her narkiness to other people. And yes. I, I don't like that aspect of the character. It kind of sorts itself out in um, school reunion. You know, she finds a way to bond with Sarah. Sarah yes. And, but yeah, particularly I think with the, the Mickey relationship um, and the uh, girl in the fireplace and in um, Rise of Cybermen, Age of Steel. I, I think that's part, part of that is Russell T. Davis 
will only write flawed characters. You know, he, I think he said that, that he has, he puts kind of two conflicting desires at the heart of every character, if I remember rightly. But, which yeah. makes him kind of come to life then. You know, there, there's, a, there's an element of selfishness at the core, which is, I think, is why a lot of people, the people who don't like Russell T. Davis, don't like Russell T. Davis because they're, they don't like being reminded that people are, can be selfish at heart. Um, but that's what makes Rose interesting at times. You know, Father's Day, for instance. But she's a very human companion. She's the only companion, re- she's the first companion who really gets that character work across that because that's how TV changed. Mm-hmm. You, know, you had to have in the original series, it's the same, almost the same characters in there to function because it's more plot run. Whereas 21st century tends more towards character work. Yes. So there is a certain amount of timing there, but Billy Piper's performance, yeah, it's stellar. And I, I would, although I would say Billy Piper's best performance is not where she's playing Rose, it's where she's playing the moment. Yeah. And, you know, so eight years on, she's going toe to toe with John Hurt and acing it. Yes. You know how good an actress she is when she's doing that. There's undeniably a great actress. Um, so, number six, are you ready for the ranking of the top New Who companion? Okay, so on then working up. Okay. You're, you're, you're trying to work it out in your head. <laughs> I think I know who it'll be. Oh, and what, well, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. They who um, can, yes, they who cannot be named. <laughs> no, uh, it's a duo. It's a duo because you can't really separate them as characters, and that probably gives it away to you. Number six is Amy and Rory. Karen Gillan. She again. It, it's like Louise Jameson. I think she is a fantastic actress and entirely justified in going on to be in world conquering films because she makes this decision she doesn't care about the character being likable mm-hmm. whereas there are elements of characters who haven't been likable before and this this is why some people don't like the character because again which sometimes there's nothing to grab onto about her being like, well, she is, she is quite selfish at times, quite cold to people. But she is, it, it's a brave choice, you know, in your first big role. Mm-hmm. How do you, to, to actually go, I don't care about being liked it. I want to be slightly different to what's come before. And she does find it. And, you know, it, obviously from a heterosexual male's point of view, it doesn't hurt that she makes her debut w- with her legs on show in in the stripper gram outfit. Let's face it. Um, I, I, I hear from an LGBT point of view that it doesn't hurt that either. <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, yeah, and then Arthur Darvel later on. I think he's he's happy not to kind of be the lead guy at times. He's happy mm. to always be the guy that people bounce off. But I think that's a very underrated and difficult role. And again, he does that really well. He he gives people room to shine, and he's got a really nice light touch with the comedy. He's also very good at gelling things together. Yes. And uh, I'm thinking of uh, Amy's choice, where he provides the emotional sort of heartbeat at the centre. Yes. Very well. Uh, I think I like the fact that even though, as you say, they set up that uh, Amy is maybe not the nicest person to other folk, uh, they do kind of set up that this is mostly the doctor's fault for damaging her badly. Um, And they can they do show character growth and then she does become a better person. Yes, but without it ever being explicitly stated. And this is kind of why I, th- I thought one of the missteps was that that 
divorce storyline in Asylum, which because the way the story's been going, I never quite bought, which is nothing against the actors whatsoever. Number five is the two who started it off. And again, I couldn't separate them. They're, they are, they are, I just found it is, of course, Ian and Barbara, William Russell and Jackie Lane Hill. Hill, <laughs> you know, which are the first two series of Doctor Who are essentially their story. It's a story of the guys who just like who just don't want to be around. They're gonna have fun while they're there, but they really want to get back to back home, and they do at the first opportunity. It's such good casting, isn't it? It's just William Russell, who's obviously been this uh, this action star with Lance a lot, um, and uh, Jack, oh, th- th- they have this instant chemistry, you know. Fandom has always gone. Let's face it, particularly in the Romans, they got they got together, mm-hmm. and when they left, of course they got married. As Russell T Davis confirmed later on, that they, they are that audience viewpoint, and the first two is crucial to that series point of view. You know, Jackie Hill is in that big mo. She's in the big cliffhangers that the uh, an earthy child, and then she's the one being threatened by the sink plunger. Mm-hmm. And she sells, and they she sells that horror at the dark so well. And let's face it, Barbara's here. Yeah. One of the seven wonders of the universe. Yes. <laughs> uh-huh. um, but no, it, it's they are the people who make that do- first Doctor Who. Because the first Doctor isn't an immediately likeable character again. Mm. Susan is... I, th- I think she's underwritten a lot for what she can do, and th- those two, they they are they they if you want they put the ordinary into the extraordinary, mm-hmm. so they are the ones who sell those science fiction stories. If the science fiction stories work, you know, if the Keys of Marinus works, if for a certain degree working, the sensor rights work. If the Daleks works, it's down to them. Mm-hmm. And again, the Dalek invasion of Earth. It's it's their world, it's their reactions which sell this story. Without them, again, I don't think we're here, you know, sixty years on. Well, I will. I have to dispute fandom's belief that they hook up in the rescue. Be, not the sorry, again. The Romans. I have to dispute. I have to dispute fandom's belief that they got together in the Romans because in an unearthly chill part one. Uh, the first person that Barbara goes immediately to to discuss is her confidant, Ian. In the Daleks, Ian is quite grumpy towards uh, Gennatis trying to flirt with Barbara, getting in the is it the Manana Chatois. They never got together in one episode years later because they've always been a couple from the start. But they've always played it as a couple. Uh, yeah. From the very beginning. And it's just explicit in the Romans, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Almost literally in the time. Uh, and, the, but, and the comedy they do in the Romans is beautifully done as well, because that far stuff they get isn't easy. They just have so many great episodes uh, and stories. I mean, you've got Jackie Hill as as texts where she has all of those moments with the thoughtful and uh, Ot Lock and and the great scenes of her with William Hartnell arguing about the, the ethics of changing history. Uh, where she confesses to Locke's all that she's not a yes. god. Oh yes. I I dare you. Oh that that is yeah wonderful. Oh and uh, William Russell and every man who's gone through national service he can, yeah. he, he can, he can defend the TARDIS if he be and often has to. Um, yeah, again, that's something we don't necessarily talk about. It's the fact that at the time, Ian being quite handy would have been quite would be quite a natural thing. Yes, to someone who'd grown when he had. Uh, um, there's a bit that I love, and sadly, the episode is missing. 
But the moment isn't because John Cura caught it on Delhi Snap. Is the moment that Ian is told that Barbara has been captured by Ella here in the crusade and he's got this look that would be straight out of, you know, the taking the films. It's yeah. like, I have certain skills. <laughs> you, 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 you know that uh, the, 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 this villain has made a terminal enemy that day that he's not even oh. aware of. And... Oops. <laughs> and when he's not doing that, he's doing dad dancing to the Beatles. <laughs> Absolutely. It's wonderful. <laughs> That's got music. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and sadly the well, Jack, well, Jackie Hill did return not as Barbara, but she can't come back yeah. because you know a... cancer. But we did get William Russell back last year. Oh, for... I I genuinely had tears in my eyes. On yes, that one. It, it's a beautiful moment. Uh, that was just, just yeah, the, you know, a, nothing nothing against. Th- the chimney, nothing is anyone who loves it, but that's just one of my favorite moments of Doctor Who of all time. Just yes. seeing the guy back after 60 years, it's yes, uh, they're just they're just our legends. And obviously, William Russell had a long career, uh, mentioned Sil Lancelot, which I picture recently, and he he's a superman, if I recall correctly. Um, yes. and uh, Jackie Hill had a lot of influence in theatre because she was uh, married to uh, Alan Rakoff oh, yes. uh, and in fact she had a very pivotal moment in British culture because in the late 50s her husband was uh, directing a film, not a film sorry a theatre play and he was struggling to cast a particular role and uh, Jackie Hill suggested this young actor she saw that she thought would be brilliant for the part, which is how she suggested John Connery for his breakthrough role. There you go. <laughs> Two major franchises, a pivotal role in both. Number four. So that is, of course, the, the much missed Liz Sladen, uh, Sarah Jean. Well, I I am sure I was expecting her to be number one. Yes, because she she always wins the polls and with good reason. Um, I think yeah. I I mean I've been rewatching again. I I don't think she works hugely well with John Pertwee's Doctor. Um, I I think the you know, it he can't do that kind of paternal relationship he had with Katie Manning. It's it it's very much feels like it's you know he's on the way out she's on the way in, but she develops a rapport with Tom Baker so quickly. I think it's uh, you know as as Tom Baker said, it's the same sense of humor. It's two scouts in the TARDIS, <laughs> and it's one of the shows obviously most popular periods. Mm-hmm. She absolutely she can absolutely sell you any danger. I, I was really watching. Um, so I've rewatched Planet of Evil and Pyramids of Mars that just this week. She's she's fantastic in in you know she can sell that. It's the, the, again, the tough thing about companion is selling that being afraid, but you know feeling the fear and doing it anyways. That bit, and she can do that. She can sell these powerful monsters. You know the, the you know, she's up against the, the Zygon. She's up against Sutek. She's up against the Crinoid in. in and she uh, she has a real charm to it as well. And even despite the fact that I wouldn't ever say Sarah's been my favourite companion, bringing her back as that icon in School Reunion and, you know, as uh, in, in The Stolen Earth and then finding a whole new audience for her, of that kid, of those kids, mm-hmm. of, of her men- also mentoring that new generation... You can't argue with you know, school reunion. I I was almost weeping at the end of it because it was just so beautifully done. But I, I think what seals Sarah Jane Smith as a great daughter of companion is not only that she works with I, I think she works with two doctors because Tear Sarah Jane doesn't work if you don't feel for those two. 
even if it's overshadowed by her compadre with Tom Baker. Um, but then, 30 years later, they bring her back and she works instantly with David Tennant. Uh, and then, uh, it wasn't Matt Smith in the series of Injured? Yes, he was. He was in The yes. Death of the Doctor. And she works with him. She 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 is a companion, an actress who works with multiple generations of incarnation of the artist. Yeah. Uh, only Nick Courtney has more. Uh, and Nick Courtney gets his exit in her series as well. Yes. Uh, I mean, I think she's great. And I think the bit that always sums up her up for me, uh, uh, discounting, of course, Invasion of the Dinosaurs, brilliant start to finish in, uh, is Pyramids of Mars, when she and the Doctor walk into the Pyramid Room a bit too soon because uh, the mummies and Zutek are there and they both simultaneously turn and go out again. <laughs> it's just so brilliantly timed. Lovely bit. But they've got to work that out between them. Yes. <laughs> yes. You need that in a story like Pyramids of Mars, which is for the most, for certainly for the first three and a half episodes, very, very dark. Yes. And as uh, fans forgot to vote for them, silly fans, I should also want to point out that I love her uh, one screen chemistry in relationship with Harry Sullivan. They yeah, just um... I understand why you're Martha left because he is fundamentally redundant yes. when once they decide not to go with um you know the likes of Richard Hearn. Yes. So, but he makes so much he, he just plays this upright. It's 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 so it would be so easy to make Harry parodic this, but he just falls this right side. It, it's like it's all like Jeremy in um in the Pertwee radio stories. Where he does fall the wrong side of that parody, I think, of that kind of that uh, upright English kind of oh, oh, bumbling kind of part. But no, it's it's there's a bit of still, and Ian Martyr really plays the hell out of that. Uh, and it's interesting because I know you like to go on the fact that the Hinchcliffe era badly overstepped the mark. It several times in terms yes. of what you should get away with in Doctor Who and people often bring up the drowning and the assassin or the various stabbings and talons or what have you uh, in robots. the bit yeah. that always strikes me has been I, I've always been stunned they could get away with it because it's still genuinely horror film horrific to see nowadays is in terror of the Zygons when Ian Martyr plays the Zygon Harry in the barn going off doing Sarah, and that's just oh, it's very well directed by Douglas Canfield, but it's like I believe they got away. Yeah, so that that is. I mean, I know there's not pitchforks lying about everywhere, but that is replicable. You know, that is replicable violence. And I know yes. I I don't hold that people go. I'm going to stab people just because I saw it on Dog 2 on the weekend. But yeah, I, I I think that's tea time stuff that's not wrong. And the other thing I think they st- overstepped it with was the Pirates of Mars with the poacher as well, Ernie Clements. Mm. He just like, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah that's like, yeah, maybe a little. But anyway, <laughs> we're not here to talk about that quite yet. So, top three. Number three is another of my favourites. The man who holds the Trout and Era together. It's Mr. Fraser Hines himself, Jamie. Oh. Yeah, again, I, I wouldn't say he's my favourite companion, but that's not nothing to do with Fraser or anything. But when I, you know, my early fandom is essentially, I, I saw, I, I know I saw bits of City of Death. I know I saw bits of Season 17. I only recount board towards the end of Season 18 as a proper fan. And I was lucky enough to get the five faces of Doctor Who early. And you, you know, you had the crotons in that. Mm-hmm. And I ended up going, this is my faith. This is Trenton and Hines and Padbury were absolutely reason I, I fell in love with that era. I would say when I was that age, you know, when I was seven, right, Patrick Trent is my favorite doctor. And these, these guys have nailed it. They are 
they have the art of playing comedy. You know, um, I'm thinking maybe seems like the one in Tomb of the Sidemen where they you know they go to hold both go to hold Victoria's hand. Mm. And oh, oops, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 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 I... yeah, it's, it's they make the they they make the, the you know, in any way your face you know you. It's deliberately designed. You know, you've got three three lead actors throughout the tri Trent era. Um, you know, once particularly um, Annika and uh, Mike Crazy are all quite short, and that is very deliberate because they want the monsters to be intimidating. You need that comic report to take that to undercut that, and that's what they do beautifully. Yes. And Trent and Hines and that comic report are why the era works. Uh, I mean. He works as the bumbling foil. He works in the sense that they showed that he, he he he's not he's historical. He's he's not thick. He's got several hundred years of of uh, history and science to catch up on. But it, you you see him catching up on it. Although he is treated a bit like um, the Basil Rathbone, Doctor Watson, next to Zoe and the Doctor at times. Um, it, it's similar to Leela. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he can also do like the the I like his relationship with the doctor and their sort of in joking style, um, and the fact that he just they they, they build they, they pivot through the first series on if he can actually trust the doctor, so that yeah. builds up to the evil and Alex where he thinks he can. And then by the end of the war games, you have the issue. The big problem for the Doctor is that Jamie's faith in the Doctor is undefeatable. Yes. And that actually that causes dramatic issues for them. It's such a turnaround from where they were once. Uh, uh, yeah, I, and I did love them. Um, although they killed him, I did love that they returned Jamie in, in the World Shapers in the comic strip in Doctor Who magazine in the late 80s. Grant Morrison, the great comic writer, went and brought him back. So if he's made that impression on someone like uh, a, as big a writer as that, you know he's good. Yeah, I, I, I also I like uh, how um, obviously happy, um, which seemingly wasn't acting. Uh, Jamie is to see uh, Debbie Watling and the TARDIS crew, and. Yeah. The continual references to Victoria being his girlfriend, and then his utter surliness and grumpiness, and how heartbroken he is when she leaves the Sergeant's crew in fury. Oh, is it, he's so good on the reaction shots, Fraser. I think that's that's where he was. You know, that, oh, aye, aye. that's that kind of thing. And of course, it does lead to one of my favourite moments in all Doctor Who, where uh, they're trying to work out how they could capture a Yeti. And of course, Jamie says to the doctor, I've got an idea. And the doctor says, Hurry, Victoria, swear discretion is the better part of valor. Jamie has an idea, run. That I that went down so well when we saw that in the BFI. We got a huge laugh. And the punchline is Jamie's plan worked. Yes. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I, I he's he's very much yeah, an amiable a counterpoint to Troughton for almost his entire series. And I don't know how true the story that Fraser has repeated many times that he didn't, he was only uh, there for the four episodes of The Highlanders, but when episode one came out, the BBC were inundated with letters saying, to keep that young man in the show and so they drafted his contract. Um, I think I, it's, a, it's a bit late. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. uh, given, given how little uh, this young man is actually in episodes one of the Highlanders, which I saw recently, but I'm also aware of Beruza's rules on these matters. If in doubt, print the legend. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, it's um, hmm, number two. Uh, genuinely a bit surprised, but. I think this may be my own fault for putting all of them as one person rather than two, which you may understand the reason. Second is Romana. I am quite surprised. I mean, Romana is 
the furthest from what we think of as the function of the companion, which is yes. to be the audience's point of view. Yeah. And we, we, we're not going to see, we're not going to sympathise with you of an omniscient Gallifreyan. But it kind of has the alienness of that Tom Baker, that middle Tom Baker era, um, where I think they only visit Earth, is it twice? Yeah, and in mm -hmm. the first two series, maybe in the and seen on Brighton Beach as well. Um, but it, I, 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 I do, I do like the idea of Romana as a companion, and you know, obviously, there's a a reason why Lala Ward has such a a good rapport with Tom throughout the throughout yes. the season. Anyway, if not necessarily the second, I mean, not, maybe not season eighteen. Uh... I mean, I should point out that in combined votes, we got votes for Mary Tam, we got votes for Lala Lord, and we got votes for Romana in general. So I just added it, them all because they're the same character. So Romana is probably higher than she might otherwise be because of that added yeah, I, thing with her character, that she's multiple people. I, I like Mary Tam's Romana, but I, I always think she's kind of encourages Tom to be a bit kind of lazy and go, well, not maybe lazy, but, you know, to, to play it over the top to almost mock the script at times. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not, it's whereas I think Liz and um, Louise challenged Tom at that point, you know, they, they force him to up his game at times. I, I I think, you know, at times in later, he's openly being disdainful of the scripts. And I, 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 th I think that's the detriment of the stories at times. I don't think Lala challenged him a lot as well. But I, I do like the idea of this omnicompetent companion. And, you know, Mary Tam in uh, Androids of Tara, one of my favourite stories, she has one of the most difficult roles to play mm -hmm. as a companion. Um, you know, she's playing essentially four different roles in that story. You know, the, the Romana, Strella, and their Android duplicates. Yes. And and it's beautiful, and and that kind of light story depends on her, and she nails it. Um, and again, Romana, uh, Lala Ward, the Horns of Nymon, uh, again, a story I do like. I, I think the production values obviously don't help, but she's basically playing the Doctor in that. Yes, and she does it brilliantly. She carries that story really beautifully. And again, I, I go, Warriors, Warriors Gate is one of the best Doctor Who stories of all. And she is, she just nails a lot of very difficult stuff to do in that. Where, you know, it's a lot of very heavy, he more heavy drama than she'd had in the previous season. Certainly probably in the first half of that season too. Yes. I mean, I'd say that I think Lawa Warp was the better actor at the time. Although I would point out that Tam went on to become quite a good actor in like eighties and nineties TV. She's a she's a villain in Poirot, and uh, she's in one of the better Jonathan Creeks, and she's quite a good sort of uh, character actress in her later days. Sadly, no longer with us. But on the flip side, also the Tam Romana is in my. Favorite, more favorite stories compared to the Lala Tam era, Mana. Um, I think the first four stories of that are all that keep something brilliant in their way, and it maybe falls apart a little in the last two. But I mean, I I I, I love Rebus Operation and Pirate Planet and Rise of Tara and chunks of Stones of Blood. Uh, Art on the ship, by any chance? Yeah, it kind of falls apart on the ship. But I love the sort of gothic first half and uh, the old lady that Tom Baker so clearly enthralled by. Oh, God, yeah, Beatrix Lehman. Yeah. Uh, that's, that, that stuff's all great. But, uh, yes. No, I think she, 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 she's more of a kind of foil for the Doctor. She's there so the Doctor can be punchline or retort funny lines yes and, and you know, when that works it works brilliantly there's a reason everyone or almost everyone loves City of Death yes because it's, it's just about those two like, like, like Black Orchid though, as we said earlier it's those two having fun almost fun at the end as of the world mean. you know the, the thing about City of Death is that it's for as good as she is with Tom because they're getting to know each other 
uh, the Romana and Duggan relationship is yeah. one of my favourite. Uh, especially when they get into the they break into the cafe, he, he smashes the wine glass, and um, he goes, uh, he, he goes, you can't, you, you, was it, I'm paraphrasing here; it's been a while, but uh, you can't, uh, you can't make an omelet without smashing a few eggs. And then Romana goes, if you made an omelet, I'd expect a, a kitchen on fire and an unconscious chef. Yeah, and it's uh, was it I, again? I'm going to misquote it, but it's you know, you know what I don't get about all this. I expect so. Yes. Oh, <laughs> but uh, no, I I think I I I think as a companion as a whole, interesting character. So it's got ups and downs as you'd expect from a companion who's played by many people on screen. At times. I also point out that interestingly, it doesn't always happen that she has a great entrance into the show. And Reboss, and she has an excellent exit from the show in Warriors Gate, but she's leaves number one, and uh, you 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 know who it is now by default. But and given that you told me that Liz Shaw isn't on this list, and who, who, <laughs> who who we know, the, what error we know people are reappraising, and who we haven't talked about yet, um, and. She won it by 25 points. Was, she was well ahead of I, uh, Romana. She Sorry? You think she aced this? Yes, she did. <laughs> it's, it's ace. Get in! <laughs> I am so happy on this one. It's, again, I, I think part of this, and I, Sophie Aldridge had such charm in this role as well, again, in a role that could have easily been a caricature, um, with of you know, because it is written by um, white men who are are not in their teens. Um, but it's the start of where you can see that companion that their character, an ongoing character, is being given consideration. Um, it, it's it's you know, it's one of the the archetypal Doctor Companion relationships in that it's. Doctor, mentor, um, so you know, so Astro and Sophie, and there is such an obvious rapport between uh, between Sylve and Sophie there. Mm -hmm. um, so she has good material to get through, and it's she is a wonderful. She plays this wonderfully again. She it, it's following on from Bonnie Langford. She has absolute charm and she is perhaps i would say in common with um with jamie with leela and even later with rose she might not be book smart but she's kind of street smart she's you know she can she can mix up an explosive mm -hmm. um she can she can survive on an alien planet on the you know, on this most unlikely of you know, a twentieth-century human on an ice planet in what in the future, I think. And blow up a Dalek. Yes. <laughs> and I think the the, the credit as well is you you can in the hands of a different actor and actress, you can see this as almost an abusive relationship with what the Doctor puts Ace through. In you know, she, he takes her to a circus. She can't stand circuses. Takes her to um, Gabriel Chase, which she burned down. Take you know, <laughs> take her mm. to the Fenric to see, see her mum, who she hates. And there's a lot of um, the Doctor testing eggs, and it it never feels like that on screen. It's the actor and the actress absolutely saving that. It's like and, you, you yeah. can get away from the fact that McCoy and Alfred are clearly very close like from day on. Yes, th there's a there's a rapport there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um yeah, and you get she gets an you know she gets a lovely story in Remembrance with you know where she gets betrayed by Mike. Um she gets she gets a lot of the teenage angst as well. I and you know she doesn't she it's like it's not again 
something you could almost see as in the hands of a less actress, it would be possibly be, you know, seen as moaning, as grumpy. But she sells it as, as more a result of anger at the world, you know, yeah. like into the mind that a lot of a lot of us have as teens. And it, it's it's actually genuinely fun forms. You could say, you know, there are times she, she there's times her limitations do show up, most notoriously in that battlefield scene. Yeah. But I don't think I think you could have given that to you know Judy Dench and John yes. Hurt, and they would have struggled. <laughs> oh, and yeah, ultimately, who else would you have wanted to, delivering that scene of Doctor Who walking off in the sunset? One of the great TARDIS crews that there has ever been. As a nineties child, I always liked the Doctor and Ace as a team. Uh, so it was a huge culture shock when I got into online fandom to find that I was an outlier. But as <laughs> my generation and the younger generation have grown up, we have become more of a majority opinion. And the... Speak as an 80s fan, when I got online, yes, I, I got online and you got to wreck art and it was the same thing we'd seen in the, the letters pages of DWB of the fans of John and Tom absolutely giving the 80s as a whole a kicking. Um, yes. Because DWB had a grudge against JNT for a start off. Well, you, you, needed, you needed these those 90s kids who were brought up on Pertwee doing his regular stuff in the McCoy repeats to go, this kid's rubbish, they're both excellent. <laughs> you know, someone who came in on the borderline between the seventies and eighties, I'd never seen that. I mean, I said yes, it's good, but particularly, I, I've always been since it first went out. I've always thought that you know, season twenty five and late twenty six are two of the best series that the show has ever done. Yes, uh, I would certainly agree. Uh, I, when you've got eight stories and the weakest of them is possibly either survival or the silver nemesis then you're on strong I think it's always seen as one of the weakest but I but I would still watch that I've still watched them more times than I can remember because again you've got that TARDIS team it, it's you know it, it's some of my comfort viewing as who and as you well know one of my in fact I, I put three or four of my favorite stories in that era and uh, to return to Chibnall's goodbye power of the Doctor, the scene where Ace reunites with the Seventh Doctor, I have genuinely rewatched that a hundred times. It's, Absolutely. It was wonderful to... And the thing is as well, Sophie Aldred, since she's been off, has always been such a brilliant ambassador for the ship. She has always had such wonderful enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. You know, even when even you know when the audience might be the, the older fanboy. No, it she just she, just a lovely person or, or appears to be from what I know of her and from the people I know who know her. And and the wonderful thing is, you know, as I say, Eddie uh, to, uh, to myself, he genuinely has fallen in love with that era too. Um, and, and I would say if you want to get people into the 20th century series, don't go, you know, don't just go, here's Genesis, here's the Ark in Space, here's, ta here's Talons, here's City of Death, here's yeah. you know, the Web Planet or whatever. Give them some of the McCoy era because that is almost as close as you get to the modern series. It's, it's a great bridge. And, and again, as I said, Syl and Sophie are such a part of why I am still in love with Doctor Who after all these years. They are, they're just, they, they are, how can I say, the A team, the Ace team? Hey, there you go. Uh, oh, well, that's the top 25 companion as voted for by the fans. Oh. 